everybody. This is Chris. And Kathy. We wanted to take a minute to thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate every listener and are grateful for this platform. Please help us share our vision by subscribing to our show through your favorite streaming app. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Petability Podcast. Check out our ever-growing list of affiliates and sponsors. Simply go to the show notes for information and links. Proceeds from purchases help to support our show. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simon, Certified Veterinary Technician and Certified Canine Rehabilitation Practitioner. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston, Licensed Physical Therapist and Small Animal Physical Rehabilitationist. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Good morning, my friend. How are you? Good morning, Chris. I'm doing well today. How are you? Kathy? Today is a Bones Day. Oh, is that a nod to Noodle? Noodle the Frog. It is a nod to Noodle. I am so sad to hear that Noodle the Pug passed. I'm not sure if anybody else is familiar with Noodle, but Noodle was a little pug who uh, brought great joy to millions of people by determining whether their day was going to be a Bones, a good day, or a No Bones, not so good day by his owner, Jonathan, picking him up and, de- and deciding whether Bones, uh, Noodle was going to stand or lie down. <laughs> yep. As a pug person or just as a dog person, it brought me great joy, but really just to see that loving relationship between Jonathan, the owner, and Noodle, the pug, and, and how much joy he brought to uh, millions of people. Right. So uh, we we're, we're definitely want to have a nod to Noodle. You know, he became an internet uh, sensation. And yeah. I think, I think Jonathan adopted him late in life. Uh, he he died of old age. Yeah. And there was actually a featured article in the New York Times when, when he passed. And that I was know. very, very recently, last week, I think. Right, Kathy? Yes, it was. Oh. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Noodle. And the reason I say today is going to be a Bones Day is because we have another awesome guest. Today, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Lori McCauley. And I actually met Dr. McCauley probably around 2006, when she invited our rehab team to come out to Chicago to tour her practice. And this was when the field of veterinary rehabilitation was really in its infancy. And and Dr. McCauley was a trailblazer in in the industry and designed the first underwater treadmill for dogs. So so for me, interviewing Dr. McCauley is like getting an audience with your favorite rock star, you know? (laughs) I landed the big, yeah, I landed a big, inter- I landed the big interview. And you guys are so sweet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and today we're going to be talking about one of our favorite topics, improving your geriatric dog's health span and lifespan. We love senior dogs. We've had senior dogs and we know how important this topic is. And, and nothing will make you more present than living with a senior dog, taking note of everything, that slow rise that graying around the muzzle, those long, deep naps. So reaching those milestones with your dog or reaching the milestone of having your dog into their golden years is truly a gift. It made me just think of the importance of movement throughout a dog's life. And maybe you think about movement, you know, externally. You think about how movement gives your dog freedom, independence, and choices. You know, the the ability to move into the sun, to bask, or to move away from something they deem, you know, unpleasant. But internally, movement engages muscles, ligaments, and tendons. It's preventing bone loss. It's important to the circulatory system. It's increasing oxygen and blood flow to tissues, feeding organs, and increasing metabolism. And movement also helps to increase cerebral capacity. So how cool is that, right? So cool. So I'm really interested to talk with Dr. McCauley about what successful aging looks like and how exercise and movement factors into a dog's health and lifespan. And what other factors should we consider for supporting our dog's body and brain as they age to give them the best possibility for a long and healthy lifespan? So before we get started, Chris, let me just give you a little bit of background on Dr. McCauley, okay? And then we'll get right into it. Dr. McCauley is a graduate of the Colorado State School of Veterinary Medicine 
And after six years in general practice, she became a pioneer in veterinary rehabilitation, starting the first veterinary rehabilitation clinic in 1998, the TOPS Veterinary Rehabilitation, and was a faculty member at the Canine Institute for 14 years. She certified in acupuncture and chiropractic therapies, and in 2014 became board certified in canine sports medicine and rehabilitation. Dr. McCauley is an international lecturer and contributing author to many textbooks and journals. She was awarded in 2011 the IMS AARV Award of Excellence in the field of veterinary rehabilitation. In 2017, Dr. McCauley opened Red Tail Rehab Mobile Practice in North Carolina, and in 2021 created Optimum Pet Vitality, an online learning platform, which we're going to talk more about today. So please welcome Dr. Lori McCauley to the show. Yes, I would like to welcome to PetAbility, the mother of veterinary rehabilitation, Dr. Lori McCauley. Thank you, guys. That was so nice. What a great welcome. We, we are really excited to have you here, too, Dr. McCauley. And I think we're going to jump right in because we have so much material to cover. We have so many questions. And I'm hopeful that maybe we could start this conversation off with you defining what a geriatric dog is. And what, what, what does that mean? So I keep it very simple. So a giant dog, right? So like your Irish wolfhounds, your St. Bernards, those are considered geriatric at eight. Your large dogs, like your German shepherds, those are considered geriatric at nine years of age. Your medium dogs, like your border collies, those are 10 years of age. And your small dogs, your chihuahuas, your Maltese, your pugs at 11 years of age the impact that we can have on the longevity of, of our pets. And, you know, and I think it's, it's both qualitative and quantitative. And that's definitely something that, that I want to get into. You know, it's not just how long they live, but, but what kind of lifestyle are they leading? So I know we're going to speak more to that. Let's talk about, you know, exercise in general and how that impacts the lifespan. So, you know, I've heard a lot of people, you know, simply ask, like, why should my old geriatric or senior dog exercise, you know, won't it potentially cause more harm than good? Or, you know, can we really change anything with exercise in an older pet? And maybe even, and, isn't it kinder? Isn't it actually kinder to just let them rest in their senior years? So I love research, right? I'm a research nerd. I admit it. I, people think I'm crazy, but I love pouring through research. And I found a research article that talked about the College of Family Physicians of Canada. And they, their recommendation was that moderate exercise, now this is for humans, obviously, that had significant or mild osteoarthritis or arthritis in their knees, which is the place, most common place where humans get arthritis. And they said that moderate exercise improved physical function and reduced pain in their patients with osteoarthritis, and they consider it one of the most underutilized forms of pain control for their patients. Exercise, even if they have arthritis, significantly increases their health span, their quality of life. So that's physical. Then we can talk about brain, uh, starting with mice. Again, I love studies. Um, <laughs> They took some, you know, it used to be that there was no enrichment and mice, research mice lived in a box. And then they took, uh, 1970s, I want to say, they took half of the mice and they gave them wheels and things to play with. So enrichment. And they found, and they, they did this, mice lived two years on average. They did this for just 45 days when they were considered geriatric. And they found that in those 45 days, those mice had 15% more neurons. So that was like over 40,000 more neurons just by those 45 days wow. of enrichment. So then they took the mice and they said, all right, well, let's try it when they're beginning to be geriatric. So when they were 10 months old, they gave them uh, enrichment for, I think it was for like eight months, right? So close to the end of their life. And what they found with those guys, this is unbelievable. Their hippocampus, so the part of the brain that's in charge of memory and learning, now think about all of our dogs with dementia or cognitive dysfunction, that part of their brain was five-fold higher. So to give you an example of that, if the brain, that part of the brain was one gram, in the mice that had the enrichment, it was five grams. Oh, wow. Huge, huge. Wow. When you study geriatrics in humans, 
they say the number one thing that you can do is have exercise at least four to five days a week. And they recommend at least 25 minutes each time. So it makes a huge difference in the body, in the brain. They, uh, okay, one more study and then I'll, I'll get off studies, but <laughs> it's just so cool because it's, it's proving what we already know. They took humans that were at end of life. So they had terminal disease and of course they got there okay. And then they said, okay, half of you guys, you're going to do whatever you want. And they just like hung out. They might read a little bit. They watch TV. And the other half, they said, okay, we're going to have you walking around. We're going to have you learn some like language skills. We're going to have you maybe play an instrument. And then when they passed, they looked at their brains and there's these, these dyes that can tell you which are the new neurons. And they said, even until the day you die, your body can create new neurons. And then we're actually, we're going to go back to mice for one second. They then divided the mice into you guys get the wheel and you guys get the toys, right? The mazes and the things to do to stimulate learning. And they found that to create this five fold increase in the hippocampus, the part of the brain for memory and learning, the mice that were only had the wheel that increased significantly the number of new neurons. And the mice that had the enrichment, it didn't increase the number of new neurons, but it increased the life expectancy. So when you combine endurance exercise with mental stimulation, that's always changing. It's not like sit down, sit down, sit, right? That that doesn't cut it. It's gotta be new things. Mm -hmm. We have a lot more neurons in our brain living a lot longer. And they were much happier. They actually lived longer, which is really, really cool because that's what we want for our pets, at least my fur babies. Is it okay if we go and and talk just a little bit about what's happening to our geriatric dogs? What's going on with their body and how they're changing as they age? You know, what's happening to their connective tissue, their nerve tissue, uh, muscle tissue, skin? What's happening as the body ages? Absolutely. So there's a couple words that may not be familiar to you. One is senescence, and that is a natural old age change where the body starts to degrade and have less ability to reproduce itself. So we have less growth factors being released and the tissues that would normally take those growth factors and create new cells, they actually have less ability to actually do that. So With senescence, we see the heart having to work harder. We see the lungs having fibrous tissue or scar tissue in them. We have the skin becoming thinner and more friable to rip. All parts of the body, the liver, the kidney, the lungs, all of that. And with exercise, they have shown that exercise increases the immune system, right? So think about all the older people in like nursing homes and things like that, that are constantly getting infections and their skin is bruising and ripping and stuff like that. Exercise, believe it or not, by increasing the blood flow can help with all of that. The other thing we can talk about is sarcopenia. Sarco, um, penia means little, right? Sarco as in sarcomeres is muscle. So in dogs specifically, well, humans too, we have different types of muscle fibers. In humans, it's mostly type one and type two. Um, Dogs also have type 2C and type 2 dog, but we're not going to talk about those. Uh, Type 1 muscle fibers are the muscle fibers that help with our posture. So if we think about, oh, you twisted your ankle or you twisted your knee or your elbow hurts, the muscles that have the tendons that attach and help stabilize those joints are our type 1. And that's what we get stronger when we're doing our endurance work. So if you look at a marathon runner, they're thin they're sleek, and they can run forever, right? That's our endurance muscles. Our gym rats are dogs that have, that are, or humans, that have lots of really strong muscle. That's type two muscle. And those muscle fibers, they're very powerful, but they're quick to fatigue. Now let's back up. As we age, we are going to naturally lose up to 25% of our type two muscle fibers. They go from muscle fiber to being replaced with fat. And when it's replaced with fat, we don't lose circumference, but we lose strength, right? We see the older people have trouble lifting things. And then actually they, it, that turns into fibrous tissue or scar tissue. 
So even if you looked at a picture of like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Now, as he's older, he looks like he's shrunk. And he did. That's because of his muscles. That's a normal old age change. And by doing exercises that can target type one muscle, we can significantly slow that process down. So our pets can continue to go on those long walks with us. Our pets have the ability to jump up and down off the rocks, over a small fence or a log. They can have the quality of life, the playfulness by keeping those muscles strong. The only way we lose type one muscle fibers is by disuse. So the dog who's like, oh, I'm not feeling so good. I'm gonna go lay down. I'm not gonna do anything. That's disuse plus they're aging. So we're losing both types of muscle fibers as well as we're not gonna have the endurance and the ability to, you know, the, the heart pumping and the lungs, all of our, our nerves. Nerves are like muscle. If you don't use them, you lose them. So our dogs that are just laying in the corner, they, they decrease their muscle tendon and ligament strength. And then they have more instability in their joints. And then they become more sore because of the instability. And then they lay around more, right? So that's a spiral down, basically slowly decreasing our quality of life. I'm sure people have heard of people saying, yeah, we put him to sleep. He just, he couldn't get up anymore. Or mm -hmm. he just laid around. He looks so sad. I couldn't do that anymore. As compared to if we can get rid of pain and get them moving, we get strength, right? We can actually, this is so cool. We can actually get four capillaries to each muscle cell. So our like high end athletes, rather than have like one capillary go into like 20 or a hundred muscle cells, we get 40 each one by exercising, right? So when you think about getting up and you're like, oh, I'm stiff. That's because we're not getting enough oxygen to the tissue or we're getting scar tissue around the joints. So my plan is always get them feeling good, increase their activity. It takes three to four weeks to strengthen muscle tissue and get those physiologic effects going. It takes three to four months of exercise to strengthen the tendons and ligaments. And that's what's going to help stabilize our joints. But again, the whole idea is we increase stability. They feel better. So they're more active. And then we cycle back up and increase their quality of life. And these, I mean, I don't know if you guys work with agility dogs. I've worked with some dogs who've competed like in nationals at 14 years of age Wow! and made it to the finals. That's impressive. Right? Yeah, that's impressive. So Dr. McCall, you, you described this kind of spiraling up and spiraling down. Terminology I use is, is inertia because I tell my clients, I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, a, a body at rest stays at rest and a body in motion stays in motion. And I think that's kind of a parallel phenomenon, if you will, to, to what you were describing. And I do think that this is something that our, our audience can relate to. I know I sure can. And when you were describing, you know, what happens to the musculoskeletal system and, and admittedly, I've been less active lately and spending much more time at my desk, which shame on me, but I'm like, no, I don't really have any loss in circumference, but I can sure tell I'm a lot weaker as, as those muscles are being replaced by fat. And when I rise from my desk, get out of bed in the morning, get out of my car, that's always a huge one. I, it takes mm -hmm. me a good few minutes to kind of loosen up. And, and so, you know, if we make these parallels to what we may be feeling in our daily lives, it's not a huge leap to assume that that the same thing is going on with our, our pets and our dogs. And I think a lot of times people forget that, you know, and, and right. we just, you know, expect things um, to never change in our dogs, you know, from when they were a puppy and, and as they're growing older. There may be also a, maybe a bit of a misconception that exercises and getting up and walking and moving your dog and doing stuff or for larger dogs. Because I'll see a lot of people with small dogs who are like, well, she doesn't, uh, she's just a couch potato. She likes to sit on the couch. She likes to rest. But this is for all dogs of all sizes. So you should get up and maybe play an enrichment game with your chihuahua or sign your pug up for nose work classes. So it's not just for these, for large dogs, it's across the board for all these dogs, for their longevity and quality of life. You know, one thing I want to emphasize here too is is just kind of circling back on, on the study from Canada you know, so many of my pet owners, when they hear from their vet that their dog has arthritis, they 
cease activity because again, right. they think right. it's painful and that they're causing more harm and they're actually protecting those arthritic joints by allowing them to rest. So they- It's exact opposite. Yes. They stop right. their, their walks. They don't ask them to sit anymore. They, you know, like with the little dogs, you know, it's so easy to pick them up and carry them around. And I always tell people, treat your little dogs like a big dog. Don't, mm -hmm. you know, carry them everywhere, um, you know, to keep them strong and, and so forth. But yeah, especially like, you know, you mentioned knees, but, you know, I think about all those people who whose dogs may be diagnosed with hip dysplasia and then get, you know, uh, follow up osteoarthritis due to that. And mm -hmm. they're like, you know, they'll come in to see me and, you know, the dogs in their latter years. And they're like, oh, no, we we stopped having having them sit, you know, when they were diagnosed at oh. two. And I'm mm. like, it's a functional exercise. They need to right? keep those those, you know, joints and muscles and tendons strong and be able to to get up from the floor. I mean, what a disservice when we're not practicing those daily activities. You know, that is an exercise. Well, and let's think about this. It's not just, you should just walk your dog, right? Because that's a general, that's more your type one muscle fibers, your endurance. You also have targeted. So you talk about the dog who had hip issues. Okay, I have to throw more research in, right? Just because I'm a nerd and I love it. I had a dog come to me that uh, I had ad adopted, right? I wanted a like six or seven, eight, nine, 10 year old lab. And I ended up with an 11 month old red, so field golden retriever, right? And I'm thinking, this is not the dog for me. And then he went to poop and he squatted all the way down. And I'm like, something's wrong with him. Okay, let me look at him. And sure enough, he had laxity at both of his hips. And I said, all right, who could be a better mom for you than a rehab vet? Needless to say, I love that dog. He's the one who, who was with me till he was 15 and a half. And he had laxity at both of his hips. And we did targeted exercise and the laxity went away and didn't come back until he was 10 and a half, which is huge. And Cindy Otto, who runs the uh, Penn Working Dog Center in Pennsylvania, was with me and I told her that story. So she got to meet Rudy. Uh, we studied for boards together and she works with bomb dogs and police dogs and all FEMA dogs and all kinds of really cool working dogs. And she had an amazing dog come in who failed his pen hip, right? So that is mm -hmm. like, oh my God, that's it. And she remembered Rudy and she said, okay, before we give up on this dog, let's spend three months. Now, everybody had been told that if you check a dog's pen hip, it's going to be the same when they are eight weeks old, when they're two years old, and when they're 14 years old. That's what we were told. In three months of doing targeted exercises with this dog, not only then did they repeat the pen hip, the pen hip exam, so how much laxity in there is their hips, he went from not a chance to, dude, you are in a great place, you're going to do well. And she wrote it up and, and um, presented it, which is amazing to think that we can change things. Every single dog that either has hip issues or is a breed that is predisposed to hip issues needs to be doing this so that they're not having pain and inflammation when they're five, six, seven, that they may get it when they're 10, 12, 14, right? We want mm -hmm. our fur babies to be with us and active, me, until the day they die, yep. right? I, uh, my dachshund was on an inclined treadmill until he was 13 and a half, three times a week. And he loved it. And the brain exercises, oh my God, the dogs, they love it. They And it's a bonding thing too. Absolutely. Right? I, I think it's worth kind of reiterating because it, what I'm hearing is, you know, it, it's not simply enough to take your dog for a walk. Walks mm -hmm. are great, but yes. there and needs to be these other types of exercises and tricks and games, a problem solving component. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've certainly seen a lot of, um, I think, uh, increase in our choices in terms of like puzzle toys and DIY things online to, to aid in this endeavor. It doesn't have to be costly. This stuff doesn't have to take a lot of time. It doesn't have to uh, take a lot of space. But but again, you know, we're, we're talking about the type one, type two muscle fibers and how each type of exercise 
affects each one of those muscle fibers. So endurance or power. But then let's make that connection again with with the brain. Can you reiterate that and the nervous system and how those specific types of exercise, again, endurance would be walking, swimming, um, and then and then these tricks and, and games and how that affects the nervous system. Well, and it's more than just tricks and games, right? So tricks and games, anything that you're going to do that is going to continue to challenge the dog. If you, If I said to you, I want you to run a mile and you're not a runner, that might be really hard. But if I said, you know what? You're going to run a mile three times a week. Within six months, running a mile is easy. So as you get stronger, you get stronger, you get stronger, you get stronger. And then all you can do is maintain. You can't get any stronger if you're still just running a mile. You have to continue to challenge Mm. to make changes in the brain and to make changes in the body. So we want to have exercises that are targeted to the things that are going to protect our joints and our spine. And then we want to continue to, I always say it's like, um, it's like if you had a hundred pennies, you can do, you can work with a hundred pennies, but then if you can make it into 20 nickels or four quarters or that silver dollar, you can take the least amount of time to have the most effect on the body and the brain. So we start with some like foundational exercises and then we kind of bring those together until you end up with just like three or four that work the whole body. But you can't start with those. Otherwise, unless you have a a strong dog, you want to start with things that are within their comfort zone and then build up. And that increases our challenge so that's constantly stimulating the brain. What are we going to do now? What are we going to, oh, we get to do this again? Yay. Oh, we're not going to do that for a week. Okay, but we're going to do it. It's awesome. There's nothing that feels better to me than getting out, you know, these things for a map during the daytime when we're going to do something like foraging boxes or find it or, you know, treadmill. And he's just so engaged and happy about it. And he loves his walks. Don't get me wrong. But for him, he would pick a mental stimulation game over any type of physical act- activity. And it's really impressive to see because he's he's a problem solver and he's uh, extremely intelligent. But what I also notice is that while he's doing things like foraging boxes, so he, he's small enough that he can go in and back uh-huh. out, go in, back out, or dig, take the paw, dig the paper out, dig, dig, dig. So all these things are mentally stimulating, but also he's engaging all these muscles by yes. doing all these like dynamic movement, you know, like side to side, digging and mm-hmm. ripping and shredding. So it's movement too. Yep. Absolutely. And they're thinking. I have in my practice, I have taken dogs that people have said, this is an international competitive dog. And I've said, I look at them, I do my exam and I said, I can tire him out in five minutes. And they're like, there's no way. This dog is so strong. (laughs) And all you have to do is engage the brain and the body and there's significant fatigue. And once you know that, then you can work the brain and the body together and they're a powerhouse, right? right? They they have the ability to function in stress. There was a study done in, I think it was the late 70s, early 80s with the armed forces. And they took puppies that were between seven and 21 days of age. And they said, okay, if we take half, of, they split the litters and half of them, they did things to create small stresses, right? To stimulate the brain, the immune system, things like taking a Q-tip and rubbing it between their toes, standing them on a frozen washcloth. So they have to think about, oh, this is uncomfortable. Oh, I can walk off of this, turning them on their side, turning them upside down. And then what they found was later on in life, by having those small stressors as babies, they were way more able to handle big stress as an adult. And they Mm -hmm. made much better working dogs. So Mm -hmm. it's the same with the exercises, right? We want to give them little things in the beginning and then progress that so that they're working their brain and their body. And I love, love, love the challenge when somebody says, you can't make my dog tired or my dog can do anything that you can ask them to do. And I'm like, okay, challenge accepted. (laughs) I'll take that challenge. Thank you. Uh (laughs) Yep. Yep. And sure enough. And that's why my dog can walk on a round ball. My dog can jump on with their back feet up onto the bed 50 times in a row. Because I want him super strong so that he doesn't get injured, right? That's 
my, one of my goals in life, one of my missions in life is to help people help dogs, right? That's my tagline is empowering people, optimizing pets so that they don't get injured because there's so many dogs who have cruciate injuries and so is strains and back injuries and elbow issues, shoulder instability, right? We want to, I want to prevent all of that. One of my favorite sayings when I learned acupuncture was a good physician, this we're talking about doctors, a good physician can heal their patients. A great physician keeps their patients healthy and they don't have problems. Hmm. And my goal was always to try to be that great physician. So Dr. McCauley, can we talk about some of the best exercises for our geriatric dogs? And can we talk a little bit about, I just downloaded the top five, you know, best exercises for your geriatric dogs. And we'll leave a, we'll put a link in our show notes so that people can get this as well from, from Dr. McCauley. It was so easy to follow. It was great. I just want to see if we can touch on some of those exercises for the geriatric dog for our, for our listeners. Absolutely. Yep. So I created the ebook, the top five exercises for geriatric dogs, and it is free to all of your listeners. You can follow the link and get that. It's not only it's when to do it, how to do it, and then how to progress it again, right? Because we want to continue to stimulate them to learn new things, to continue to strengthen their muscles. In that book, there's five exercises and a bonus. And one of them is rhythmic stabilization. And I would love to, is it okay with you guys if I explain to your listeners how to do this so that just from listening, they have something that they can work with their dog or even as they're listening, they can work with their dog and Please. see what it feels like to work with your dog and see how the dog likes it. Awesome. All right, let's go through rhythmic stabilization. Rhythmic stabilization is a wonderful exercise. It can be done with three-week-old puppies adults, athletes, a little bit easy for athletes. You'd have to add some challenges to it. And it is totally safe for your geriatric dogs. You can do it if they just had, well, maybe not just had, but a couple of weeks after a fracture so that they're, they, as long as they can stand, we can use this exercise. Actually, I say that my neurological patients, we put them in sternal. So laying with their elbows under them on their chest and their feet under them. And we can do it in that. We can do it in tall sit. It is an amazing, amazing exercise. I'm going to walk you through it as a person first. So if there's a person with you, you can do it. Then I'm going to explain it as on the dog. So if a person is standing there and you say, I'm going to use you as an example, Chris. Chris, stay. Don't move. Don't move any muscle in your body. And then I push on your shoulders. What you have to do to stay is to push against me. So that is turning on all of your stabilizer muscles in your core, your legs, you're gonna push in. Um, if I'm pushing on your shoulder, you're gonna push with your, your body toward me. And then I'm gonna change directions. I'm gonna say, okay, now I'm gonna move in a different direction you have to stay. And now maybe I'm pushing from the front of your shoulder and now you're engaging all of your abdominal muscles, the back of your legs. If you were a canine, it would be all four legs, right? So by doing this exercise, we can literally stimulate, turn on all the muscles in the body except the head and neck. So we have to do another exercise for that, but we get everything else, which is amazing. So it's totally safe. There's no sheer force or lateral force. There's, there's no added compression. It's not like jumping or anything like that where you're compressing the joints. So it's safe for dogs with arthritis, pretty much for almost for everybody. So now how do we do this in the dog? We're going to play with julep. Chris is going to follow what I tell her to do, and we'll see how Julep likes this. Hey, Chris, I just want to let our listeners know that if they would like to follow along with this demonstration with you and Dr. McCauley and Julep, they can go to our YouTube channel at Petability Podcast, and it will be under the title Julep Demos Rhythmic Stabilization. So we're going to start by having her stand nice and square, and we're going to ask her to stay. Now, she's a six and a half year old tricolored cavalier and she has significant heart issues. So this is a perfect exercise for her. It's not going to stress her out and we're going to be able to turn on, like I said, all of her muscles except for head and neck. So now what I want you to do is take your left hand, Chris, and put it on her collar, right? And that's just telling her to stay with a physical, I feel this, oh, okay, you want me to stay here. Now I want you to take your right hand and put it on her hip and pull her slightly to you. Enough that you feel her muscles contract, 
but not enough that she has to step out or fall over. We're going to count to three, which you've already done. So that's good. Now, what I want you to do is gently let her go. Yep. You don't want her to like fall because you let her go too quick and go the other direction. So, yep, on her hip. Again, perfect. Count to three. You don't want to do this fast because then you're just turning on the receptors between the muscles and it's a quick like shock, right? The the Golgi tendon organs. What we want to do is have those muscles contract and hold. So now what I want you to do is move up to her mid chest and do the same thing. <laughs> Make sure you're praising her so she knows that what she's doing is correct, right? We want... We want them to know the difference when I push the dog and say, okay, get out of my way versus stay. And I want you to contract your muscles. Now move up to her shoulders. So like the point of her shoulder, there you go. And do it again. By doing that, we're getting front end, we're getting rear end, we're getting her trunk. Now what I want you to do is put your hands on both of her shoulders and you're gonna pull her straight back. Again, tell her to stay, praise her when she stays. And then I want you to take your thumbs and your thenar process, so the bottom part underneath your thumb, yep, and go behind her hips. Think about your thumbs like goalposts. Yep, now wrap around and gently push her forward. Ask her to stay. So what you might need to do is tickle under her, between her legs. There you go, like her belly, so that she knows you want her to stay. There you go. And push up slightly. It looks like you may be pushing down. So if you're pushing up slightly, she should go forward. There you go. Beautiful. Can you feel the difference? Now she's like, I get this. This is what you want. I'm pushing, you're pushing my, my weight forward. Beautiful. All right, let's add one more thing because I always love to add things. Now what I want you to do is go back up to her shoulders, but just on one side. And I want your direction of pull to be from her shoulder to the opposite hip. So now we're getting the diagonals and that is going to work on the obliques in our abdominal muscle, uh, the obliques of our abdominal muscles. Excellent, as well as working front and rear leg. And then the other way. So now going from her left shoulder toward her right hip, and then do it from her pelvis, going from hip to opposite shoulder. Remember to come, kind of come up as you're doing it. Remember with your other hand, you can always tickle her belly if she wants to sit as a gentle reminder of, I'm asking you to stay. Good job. Very yes, good yeah. job. So oh, that was interesting for me, because it was much more challenging than I thought it would be. I mean, I've been doing rhythmic stabilization, I thought, for most of my career, but not that way. And I noticed that Julep was really working and it was asymmetrical. Mm -hmm. So when I would push um, on one side, she could hold better than on another side. Mm -hmm. Also, as I touched different points in her body, she was more stable, for example, through her shoulders and kind of that mm -hmm. rib cage. But uh, in her rear end, she she was pretty floppy and, uh, you know, just wanted to to sit down. I also noticed that her back really roached up or rounded out as we were mm -hmm. doing this. Yep. And I don't know, is that a sign of weakness, Dr. McCauley, yep. or is that her engaging her abdominal muscles to, to hold? She should be able to stay square and do that. Mm -hmm. So yep. unless she was uncomfortable and that was causing her to roach, it was probably a sign of weakness, um, especially because you were pushing up, right? If you were pushing straight and she was roaching, eh, maybe, but my guess is her epaxial muscles, so yeah. the muscles yeah. above her transverse processes and ribs is weak. And if she stays in a roach position, the muscles and her, her hip axial muscles, so the ones underneath, are going to be stronger and shorter. And that tells us as a diagnostic test, okay, you need to be doing an exercise with her like front feet raised, nose to the sky. So cookies, mm -hmm. nose to the sky to engage those hip axial muscles. Wow. That seemingly simple exercise, like you said, was very diagnostic in showing me where we're, we're lacking and what we need to work on. So thank you. You're welcome. And remember, I have a course. I have two courses, one for veterinary professionals that goes through a lot of the diagnostic stuff as well, and one for pet parents. And it goes through when, where, why, how, 
what to look for, how they cheat, what it means, when to call the vet because something's wrong, when to progress, all of that stuff. And it takes you through. And I have had in my professional course, many rehab certified veterinarians, technicians, PTs go through it and go, oh my gosh, I, I've been doing this for a long time and didn't realize. And now I'm getting much better results with my patients, which again is heartwarming for me. So again, how powerful that exercise was, but yet seemingly so simple, no special equipment needed. You can do it anywhere. Not a lot of space. Didn't take long before we saw her fatigue. And again, stunning. So thank you. And it's described really well, Chris, in that top five exercises for geriatric dogs. It's described really well there. And keep in mind, people, that 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 was just one. (laughs) There are four more exercises that you can benefit from. Dr. McCauley, can you talk about what you would advise every person, whether they're a, a professional, a veterinary professional, or pet parent to look for before or after any exercise sessions? So what are some good like rules of thumb? Awesome question. I always take a look at where they're at and have an idea of where I want them to be, right? So like we just talked about with Julep, we could see that she was rochi, so kyphotic, and say, okay, that's weak apaxial muscles. Let's do some exercises to turn those muscles on or some facilitation like rubbing up the back muscles, up the opposite direction of the growth of the hair and then say, okay, do we see a change? So my rule of thumb is before you start an exercise program, you ask the dog to stand. Uh, I recommend if you're a professional or if you're a pet parent who really, really, really wants to know this and do it well, you take a picture, right? How are they standing? How are they sitting? How are they laying down? Then you do the exercises and then, and one more and how they walk, right? What's their gait like? Then you do the exercises and then say, is there a difference? So if I had a dog who maybe had a cruciate injury and was not fully weight-bearing on one of their limbs, I would want when they got done for them to either be the same or better. I don't want them to be more lame. Otherwise, I'm teaching them how to compensate, which is more likely to tear the other cruciate, the last thing we want to do. I want them to be done and be like, Oh, yeah, I got it. I can put more weight on this. No problem. The other rule of thumb I have is how often do we exercise? If they're really weak, you can do it two or three times a day. It may be every time I feed my dog, I'm going to be doing five sit-to-stands or we're going to walk backwards around the house or we're going to you know, put our front feet up and I'm going to feed you with your front feet up and that's going to help strengthen your trunk and your back legs. It can be as they get stronger, okay, we can do it a little bit less often, but more exercise. Whereas in the beginning, we might be doing it for 30 seconds or two minutes. Now we're doing it for five minutes, 10 minutes. And then as they get stronger and stronger and we're really pushing them, think about like marathon runners. They run five days a week, but they don't run long. They run one, you know, up to 20 mile run per week but the rest, they might be running three miles, five miles, seven miles. We want to do the same with our dogs. Not that I'm ever telling you to run your dog anywhere from five to 20 miles. I'm saying we might want to do longer exercise sessions a couple times a week, and then the rest of them shorter. And and that's a nice balance to let the muscles rest and heal, as well as pushing them so that they change physiologically so they can get stronger. What about transitions. Isn't that a good way? Oh, yes, absolutely. Transitions. Watching the dog go from a stand to a sit to a down to a sit to a stand. Okay. Caveat here. That's most dogs. You take an Aussie, they want to go from a stand to a down and a down to a stand. You take a greyhound and they want to go from a stand to a bow to a down to a stand, Mm -hmm. right? So whatever your dog's normal transitions are, You want to see if that changes, right? Are they shifting their weight to the left? Are they pulling their weight forward? Do they have all their weight on their right rear leg as compared to the left rear leg when they go down and up? All of those things give us an idea of where the dog is. And when you say natural way of transitioning, is that based on 
the confirmation of the breed or or what they were designed to do? I would say it's usually based on the breed. Like I said, greyhounds, to me, greyhounds are from Mars. They're just so different than other breeds. Mm -hmm. And I love them. Don't get me wrong. I adore greyhounds. I think they're amazing. And they're the only dog that unless you significantly teach them, they don't understand what sit is. Right. Their range of motion in their back end is totally different than every other breed. When they transition, if you don't know what normal is, you think that something's wrong because they go from a stand to a bow. So down on the front end before they drop their back end. And almost every other breed goes the other way. Dr. McCauley, did you want to talk a little bit about myos and how that might yes. affect our geriatric pets? Absolutely. So let me tell you the story of Myos. Again, I'm a research nerd. So I saw a thing come across my email that said free continuing education, one credit on a study. And it had to do with muscle. And I'm like, all right, that's right up my alley. This is great. So I listened to it and it was on fortitropin, the active ingredient in Myos. And it was in human geriatric patients. And it showed that the patients that were on the Myos had more muscle strength and were functionally improved. I'm like, okay, that's cool. And I kind of kept it in the back of my head. A couple months later, another study comes up. They had published dogs that had cruciate injuries. Half of the dogs had the cruciate surgery and were put on a macronutrient equivalent. So the placebo, right? But it's not, it had the same macronutrients. And then half of the dogs had fortitropin. And what they found was the dogs that were on the cheese-based supplement, they had atrophy, right? You expect after surgery, you're going to have atrophy. Dogs that were on the fortitropin had either no atrophy or very little atrophy. When you look at the product that they've done studies in the past looking at fertilized eggs and non-fertilized eggs, and fertilized eggs have a significantly different effect on mTOR in the body. So mTOR is a chemical in the body that when it's high, it suppresses something called myostatin, myo muscle statin stay. As we age, myostatin increases and it stops our ability to create muscle. So by increasing mTOR, we drop that down and we're allowed or able to build muscle. So I took all of this information. I'm like, that's really cool. I learned about mTOR and those cycles when I studied for boards. So I called up the company and I'm like, listen, I have a 12-year-old Mastiff. I do exercises with him every day. We walk a couple times a week. He's got five and a half acres. He plays. He chases the birds. I know exactly what his strength level is. I know how exactly what his muscle level is because I do chiropractic with him. I do acupuncture with him, right? I'm working with him. My hands are on him all the time. I said, you give me enough product for free that it makes a difference in my dog that I can tell and I will let other people know about it. And they sent me a 12-week supply. Now, he's a big dog. He's 95 pounds, right? He, and let's reiterate, he is a 12-year-old Mastiff. So that puts us into the very geriatric end or range. Now, they would tell me that you can see results in as little as two weeks. But they sent me 12 weeks probably to cover their bases. And I don't blame them at all for that. My dog is a different dog. My dog had trouble. I would have to hold one paw to get him to sit up and beg. Now, he has had a fracture repair. He's had medial patelluxation surgery when he was little. So he has some issues. Why I work with him often. My dog can now sit up and beg and do high five. We're up to 16 reps. I can have my dog. He's Now, he will turn 13 in February. So he's con obviously continuing to get older. Put his front feet up on the ball, a round ball, not even a peanut ball, and walk it. We could do a figure eight around my living room, dining room. Uh, so it's probably 40 to 60 feet. He could not do that at all before. So I was like, okay, this is cool. So then I started recommending it to my clients. And I said, hey guys, you know, uh, this is what I'm seeing. Because again, I work with a lot of athletes, post-surgery, and a lot of geriatrics. And the patients that I put on the myos are like, holy cow, this is great. One of my clients, again, who is a international competitor, we did, now again, it, you can't just give that. Um, we want to have exercise with it. But she took her six-year-old dog and put it on Myos. And three months later, she said, Lori, I don't believe this. 
She said, I realized I had to take a picture of my dog on the start line. And I looked at it now compared to three months ago. So we had been doing exercises with her dog and put her dog on miles after the evaluation. So it's only been working for three months. She's like, it's a different dog. I can see so much more muscle in my dog and she will be competing to go on the international team again. She thinks she has a really good chance, which is awesome. I do have to do, you know, the positives and the negatives. I have had one patient who was allergic to chicken have an allergic reaction. But if you do have a chicken allergy, one thing to watch for. And I have one patient who is a Dutch shepherd. So this is like, whoa, crazy dog. Mm. And she was on myosis and she got injured. And we had to pull her off because she was going crazy out of her skin. And when we took her off, she came down a little bit. So I think it increases their energy as well. So I think it's a really, really good product. If you have a patient who is a couch potato and you have no goals for exercising or working or anything like that, unless they're geriatric, it may not be the right supplement for you or them. But if you have a geriatric dog, a dog post-surgery or a dog that you want to increase energy and muscle, I think it's a great possibility. And again, best when combined with the five exercises, for example. Absolutely. And I just got permission from Myos. If your listeners put in OPV25, they would get 25% off of the product, any of the -the over-the-counter products. Awesome. Yes. So not the vet formulas, because those are like prescription formulas, but all the -the over-the-counter ones. Yep. So since we're talking about that, as we finish up, let's go back to your course. So Dr. McCauley, we understand that you have a new course coming out. You touched on it a bit earlier. Let's hear a little bit more about it. And again, how our listeners may access it. Absolutely. So for the professionals, we have a course that is for geriatric dogs. And if you went to OptimumPetVitality.com, you would see, if you go to courses at the top, you would see that. So for our professionals, we have Optimum Geriatric Exercise. And there's 24 exercises. There's information on what to look for, including overheating and progressions, as well as looking at the biomechanics of the handler, as well as the dog. For our pet parents, we have Core and More. So basically core exercises and more foundational core exercises for your dog. That is for the pet parent. It has similar information to the geriatric exercise program, but it is based more at a level for the pet parent. And for the pet parents, if they go to OptimumPetVitality.com and sign up for the core and more class, use the promo code PETPOD22, that's P-E-T-P-O-D-2-2, and you'll get a discount on that course. So we are thrilled to be able to pass that on to you um, as a thank you to our listeners, but also because we believe in this mission of helping as many dogs as possible. So, you know, we're all on the same page here and we want you to, you know, reap the benefits of of taking this course. What should people expect from the corn more? They're going to help, those exercises are going to help prevent injury and strengthening. Is that what they're Yes, exactly. And again, it can be anything from your brand new puppies. You get them down at, you know, six, eight weeks. Actually, the beginning exercises you could even do with, if you're a breeder, younger puppies, Mm. working on balance and proprioception, strengthening all the core muscles, a a lot of the type one muscle fibers, some of the type two muscle fibers, everything is totally safe. Now, obviously, if you just had surgery yesterday, you're not going to be doing these exercises but they are very, very safe for your dogs. They should never be uncomfortable. It goes through things, what to look for when it, there's a problem, right? So that even if you're like, I don't know, is my dog supposed to be doing this? Or he's cheating this way. How do I fix it? How do I make sure my posture is okay? How do I progress it so it can continue to use it? These 24 exercises could take you as long or as short of a time as needed. And even for your athletes, this is a great foundation. I had a challenge out two years ago called the Ultimate Exercise Challenge. And I had Sid walking on a peanut ball and I said, 
who wants to learn how to do this? And you know, a bunch of people are like, that's really cool. And one of my old clients from Chicago said, yes. And I went, ding, 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 ding. Mm -hmm. Laura, you can do this. She's an amazing, amazing person. And I said, okay, we're going to do exercises. And we went through, it literally took her almost a year, but she got her 10-year-old Sheltie walking on a peanut ball. Mm -hmm. And as an 11-year-old Sheltie who does agility, she is now the seventh fastest, I don't remember if it's Sheltie or dog, doing agility for that jump height. I think it's of all, all oh, breeds, no. it may be Shelty, but, <laughs> and she totally credits to the exercises that I worked with her with. And, you know, we're talking about all the, the physical benefits, um, you know, but, but also the enhancement of their brain and, and mm -hmm. but let's not forget again, the bond, the development yes. of the pet human bond, and that it will be so much fun. Right. Well, right. and to give you an idea, I am one who teaches you to understand, not just to do. So this is a 15 hour course and it not only has the videos, but it has proceedings. So I took the time to write, oh my God, it's like 130 pages of information. And you know, it's in little bits and pieces. It's totally readable. So with each little, there's over 75 videos in there with each little video, there's, you know, a page or less of something to read so that if you are an auditory learner and you listen and that's how you learn, that's covered. It kinesthetic, if you're doing what you see on the screen, you're learning. I myself am a visual learner. So I actually have to read things as well as see them to learn the best. So I have, I taught the rehab certification course for 14 years. I learned, I studied, how do I teach? How do I help my students to the absolute best I can? And I put all of that into this course. Dr. McCauley, once somebody invests in, in these courses, do they have lifetime access to them so they can do them that's, at their own pace? That's a great question. Everybody has a different pace of going through it. So the courses are actually for, you pay for the course and you have it for six months. And if you're done, you're done. And that's great. If you want more, it's literally less than $5 a month to continue. And then you could have it for as long as you want. Thank you, Dr. McCauley. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It's so much fun to share. I just, I love working with people and helping dogs. Well, that's, a, that's apparent as you've dedicated your yeah, life yeah, to this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so where can, where can our audience find you? Where's the best place for them to look? So they can go to optimumpetvitality.com and they can sign up to get our learn and go information or on the top of the website, it says learn and go. And if they click on that, there's over 70 different videos and information on exercises and laser, because that's the two courses I have out right now that they can get to, to watch for free. They can sign up to get, when we put out a new learn and go, it'll come right to their email box. They can go to OPV store on top to see the equipment, courses. I'm at OPV, it's what I do. Awesome. So we'll definitely have OptimumPetVitality.com uh, in our show notes. Check it out, folks. Again, Dr. McCauley, thank you so much for your time and expertise. This has been a sincere pleasure uh, today to, to speak with you and learn from you. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on social media at Petability Podcast. And please check out our affiliates and sponsors. Simply go to the show notes for information and links. Thank you and tune in next time.